Hello, everybody. We are very happy to welcome you to this lecture here today. Uh, my name is David Boeren, and together with my colleagues here at Studium Generale, I organize all kinds of lectures, film screenings, workshops, and more, from movie screenings to scientific discussions to philosophical discussions. We do it all. Hard work pays off. You snooze, you lose. Or quitters never win, winners never quit. Nowadays, inspirational quotes like these follow you around wherever you look. From crypto bros to entrepreneurs like Gary Vaynerchuk. Being on the grind seems to be all the rage. But why do we want to work on ourselves that much? Is success really a matter of hard work, or does luck also play a role? And does it make you a loser if you don't succeed? Today, Thijs Leister will answer these questions. Dr. Thijs Leister is Assistant Professor of Philosophy of Art and Culture at the Rijksuniversiteit Groningen. He wrote multiple books on philosophy, culture, and the arts. In 2016, he published the book The Grote Vlucht Inwards, The Great Leap Inwards, about the rise of individualism in the Western world, and in 2019, the book Verenigt U, Unite, about the need to unite and come together. Today, he will explain where the need to succeed comes from and whether it is realistic. Why do we focus so much on ourselves? And can we learn to focus more on each other? Please give a warm welcome to Thijs Leister. Thanks for that kind introduction and uh, thanks also for the invitation to be here. Uh, very nice to be in Rotterdam. Actually, this, uh, I think, is my first uh, public lecture again since, um, well, the end, uh, end, let's hope, that it's the end for now uh, of the uh, pandemic. So this is very uh, exciting also for me. Um, today, I'm going to talk about... Um, I'm going to tell you how to win in life by meditation and by investing in cryptocurrency. No, I'm kidding, of course. That's not what I'm going to talk about. Um, if you wanted to hear that, you've come to the wrong place. Or probably you actually did come to the right place, because that is what people do at uh, Erasmus University, I think. But you come to the wrong room, because it's not what I'm going to talk about uh, tonight. Rather, what I'm interested in is indeed how this kind of imperative to, to win, to succeed, how it became such an important aspect of our working lives, or what one could also call uh, the uh, dominant work ethic. And what does it say about our uh, changing conceptions of work and success, and success in work and success in life. And finally, what are the implications of these kinds of changing conceptions, these changing cultures, you might say, uh, implications in terms, as I will later uh, talk about, precarity, mental health, and uh, economic inequality. And uh, to talk about that, I am going to uh, proceed in the following way. Uh, so first, I'm, I'm going to talk a little bit about the notion of post-Fordism in relation to uh, neoliberalism. Then I'm going to talk about creativity, spirituality, and self-precarization as the kinds of characteristics of, of contemporary working life. And finally, I'm going to talk about the possibility, with a question mark uh, at the end, of a new class struggle. Is, is there a need for a new class struggle? And, and what would that mean? And who would be actually struggling with whom? And I've here also on the sheet uh, um, added the, uh, the book covers. Uh, obviously as a kind of a shameless self-promotion uh, and uh, as, as to show off uh, of, of how successful I am, uh, but also um, uh, obviously for in case you want to do some further reading on the kinds of topics that, that I'm uh, talking about tonight. So my lecture today is mainly based on, on these two uh, books, the one from 2016, which is al already a little bit older, and uh, the one from 2019, published ac uh, actually right before uh, the start of the pandemic. Uh, there is some interesting resonance, uh, w which we um, could go into later. 
Uh, and additionally, a third book will uh, come out in October, which is in, in a way a kind of continuation of, of the story that, uh, that I'm telling tonight. But let me start this lecture by discussing a famous Dutch philosopher. This is, obviously, Louis van Gaal. And why am I mentioning him here? I want to mention him here because uh, in um, one of my books I rely uh, quite heavily on one of Louis van Gaal's concepts, namely the concept of the total human, or in Dutch, uh, the totale mens. Uh, uh, Louis van Gaal introduced the so-called principle of the total human, by which he meant that uh, he cared not only for the player on the field, so he was not only interested in, in, the, in the soccer player on the field, but he was also interested in the human being outside of the playing field. So he was very much concerned with the well-being of his players, their mental health, their family life. This was also why, for instance, during the World Cup of 2014, which we so uh, regrettably lost, of course, in, in the finals against Spain. Uh, but during this uh, World Cup, uh, towards the end of, of each match, we could sometimes see uh, women and children of the players coming up the, up the field, and, and the players would uh, show, um, uh, be in front of the cameras together with their uh, little uh, daughters or, or, uh, or sons. Uh, and this was, as it were, all part of this principle of the total human by Louis van Gaal, who indeed argued that for the player to, to perform properly, uh, they, uh, as it were, uh, he should focus not only on, on this particular aspect on, uh, during the, the match, but on the kind of uh, total human. So to quote uh, Van Gaal here, he uh, says the following, I believe in the total human. The environment of the player is important. With Christmas, they prefer to be at home with their wi wife and kids. Hopefully, they will then give everything on the field so that we can beat our opponent. Now, this sounds, of course, very sympathetic, you might say. It sounds very nice. But um, if you think a little bit uh, longer about it, and if, if you read also this, this passage uh, carefully, um, he, he writes, hopefully they will then give everything on the field so that we can beat our opponent. It, it also sounds a bit like a kind of instrumentalization of the private life and the family life of the, of the football player for the success on the field. So in, in a way, all these women and children that are dragged along to, to the world match are the instruments for the success of the Dutch team. Now, why am I telling all this? Uh, why am, am I talking about uh, Louis van Gaal? Because this is, in, in a way, uh, exemplary for, um, uh, for our own professional lives and, and how we have, have dealt with it increasingly. So, in a way, this, this principle of the total human is not at all unknown to us. Rather, it is everywhere around us. And this kind of blurring of working life and leisure, of private life and professional life, or a kind of instrumentalization of, of personal life for professional life is indeed something that we can encounter everywhere around us and uh, which are actually key elements, I would say, of post-Fordism and of uh, neoliberalism. So let me look a little bit deeper into that. And indeed then, uh, first of all, this, this notion of neoliberalism. Of course, neoliberalism has become uh, a, a kind of a buzzword, you might say. Uh, we we, we uh, hear about it a lot. Uh, it's not always used in, in a very precise way. It's very often it's referring to uh, privatization of, of public goods, of uh, the dem uh, demolishing of the welfare state, of austerity politics, uh, commodification of everything, uh, and so forth. But I, I want to focus here most of all 
on what you could call a cultural aspect uh, or dimension of, of neoliberalism and, and how it uh, changed the way we look at ourselves and the way it uh, also changed our conception of, uh, of labor. And, uh, well, per perhaps to, to give a little bit of, of uh, personal background here, also w when, I, when I wrote this, uh, this uh, second book that I mentioned, Verenigd uh, so Unite, I actually started out also with, uh, with a story of my grand uh, grandfather and uh, the, uh, the way that he was uh, very much engaged in worker struggles and worker parties and, and, and those kinds of things. And, and I was uh, suddenly, in a way, um, fascinated by the fact that, that not a lot of people today refer to themselves really as workers, uh, in, in Dutch, uh, arbeiders. There, there, are little, uh, there are a few people who indeed consider themselves as, as workers in, in this kind of traditional sense which uh, uh, I found interesting, which I think uh, has a lot to do with our uh, changing conceptions also of, of work and how we conceive ourselves uh, or not conceive ourselves as, as workers. And, and one of the reasons for that, I think, uh, has already been mentioned in the, in the late 1970s by uh, the philosopher Michel Foucault, who talked about neoliberalism, uh, indeed already in, in the 1970s, and talked about how neoliberalism um, creates a kind of new subjectivity, a new understanding of, uh, of ourselves, a new kind of self-conception, which is indeed different than the kind of way that work and, and labor was considered, let's say, in the, in the industrial age. So, uh, very uh, broadly speaking, of course, in, if, if you look at the work of uh, Karl Marx, for instance, uh, he understands labor as being in, the, in a kind of exchange relationship with, uh, with capitalists, um, and the labor sells their labor power uh, to the capitalist on, on a kind of capitalist market, right? And according to Foucault, with neoliberalism, this kind of relation is, is changing. And to explain that, he uses the terms human capital and uh, the laborer as an entrepreneur of the self. Let me uh, give a quote here. Uh, yeah, so uh, Foucault writes the following. The stake in all neoliberal analysis is the replacement every time of Homo economicus as partner of exchange, so this was the kind of Marxian conception, with a Homo economicus as entrepreneur of himself, being for himself his own capital, being for himself his own producer, being for himself the source of his earnings. So this is, this is Foucault. And what is interesting, I think, what, what Foucault already sees there, and, and what we are, think, uh, I think, very much living in, in today, is this idea of uh, human capital, so the idea that um, uh, uh, what the, the kind of choices you make in life, kind of life choices, are, as it were, considered as investments, investments in the kind of uh, um, a company that you yourself are, right? So in, in a way, this kind of distinction that, that Marx still made between capitalists and, and, uh, and workers tends to fade here because we are in a way all capitalists in the sense that we all are, as it were, uh, uh, the managers of our own human capital. And this indeed means for Foucault that we become an entrepreneur of ourselves, that we, as it were, manage our own human capital. Uh, so, for instance, in, in terms of the life choices of uh, health, or if, well, let's say if I move from uh, Groningen to uh, Rotterdam, then I am investing in my human capital because uh, pr probably the, the, the chances of me getting a job in Rotterdam might be higher than in, uh, in Groningen. So that can be considered as a kind of investment in human capital, but also indeed traveling or all kinds of uh, uh, all, all kinds of things that you do outside of your professional life 
can be considered as, as these kinds of investments. Uh, the, the, the kind of uh, take a student that 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 uh, goes to do volunteer work in in Africa, uh, building uh, 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 building a school or working at a school. Uh, uh, those kinds of things can also be considered as a kind of entrepreneurial activity or a kind of investment in your human capital. So this is indeed according to Foucault, um, what, what happens with neoliberalism and, and a kind of uh, new self-conception that emerges with neoliberalism, which basically entails the total economization of life, because indeed everything tends to become such an investment. And we also talk about how we invest in relationships, right? The, the, and, and if you don't get a kind of return of investments, then you will uh, break up your relationship, right? So all these kinds of things are, are talked about in, in economic terms. And it also means, like I said earlier already, that there's no longer this kind of strict restriction, uh, st strict distinction between what happens, as it were, on the workplace and what happens outside it. So this is, again, this kind of Louis van Gaal principle of the total human, that, that uh, everything outside of the workplace is still, as it were, instrumentalized for uh, productivity. And finally, what it entails, and I will come back to that later, <coughs> it uh, puts a lot of pressure on the individual, right? Because it means that if you, um, for one reason or another, uh, fail or don't uh, make your career, as it were, then you apparently made the wrong investments with your human capital, right? You, you, uh, um, you invested in the wrong stocks, so to say, with your, with your human capital. So like I said, I, I will get back to that later, how that puts a lot of pressure on, on individuals and on, on individual choices, and indeed uh, uh, in part explains also this, this focus on individual success that, uh, that uh, we talked about in the beginning. Now, of course, this, this, as it were, this attitude towards labor stands not on its own, but hangs very closely together with all kinds of material conditions of work and labor, and this is indeed sometimes referred to as post-Fordism. Now, um, post-Fordism, of course, comes from Fordism, and Fordism, again, comes from uh, Henry Ford, uh, the famous, uh, famous uh, car manufacturer. He was uh, one of the first um, uh, uh, manufacturers who worked with a conveyor belt with all the uh, workers in one place with the strict di um, uh, uh, division of labor and with kind of standardized products. There's this, this famous saying of Henry Ford that he says, you can have my car in any color you want as long as it's black. Right, because it, it was basically the only color that they produced because they had to produce these kinds of standardized uh, products. And with that came also the kind of standardized labor. So a strict division of labor, strict distinction between uh, work and, and leisure, so a very uh, strict working hours. And perhaps this has been most beautifully uh, exhibited in this movie by uh, Charlie Chaplin, Modern Times. I don't know if you've seen it, but otherwise you definitely should, because it's one of the most beautiful satires of this kind of industrial labor, where the worker here uh, is behind the conveyor belt the whole day, uh, turning the, the exact same screws the entire day. So he gets, as it were, drilled by the machine, and once uh, the, the, the factory whistle blows and, and the work time is over, he still can only make this uh, movement the whole time. So he walks through the streets and he is constantly doing this. And well, it, it's, it's very funny. But this is, of course, not how work um, looks like anymore, at least uh, in, um, uh, for most of us and at least in, uh, in the West. Rather, if we look at uh, working life, in our own country, then it very much revolves around uh, communication, uh, information, uh, giving presentations, having meetings, having meetings about presentations and um, uh, presentations about meetings and so forth and so on. Um, and uh, so this is sometimes also referred to as 
uh, a cognitive capitalism, uh, the, 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 f the fact that capitalism revolves around cognitive processes or information or communicative capitalism uh, or semio-capitalism, so uh, capitalism revolving around uh, science. Uh, so these are all kinds of uh, academic uh, labels, you might say, for, for these kinds of changes in, in the capitalist mode of production. And indeed also referring to the fact that labor becomes increasingly immaterial, immaterial you might say, so not a kind of heavy uh, uh, a physical labor, but increasingly revolving around communication and, uh, uh, and information. So one, one famous example of that is uh, the so-called Googleplex, the, the headquarters of, of Google, um, and if you look at this, uh, these these uh, these uh, images, then it looks a bit more like a playground, right, for kids, than uh, than an actual office with with swings and and slides and and all those kinds of things. Um, and uh, Google was was uh, also a couple of times elected as the kind of best employer because they uh, you could bring your own dog and you could sport and you had uh, terrific lunches and you could play volleyball and uh, table tennis and all those kinds of things. Uh, but of course, you might say that all those things are also meant for the employer to keep the employees on the premises, right? Because you. You cannot say, well, I have to leave because I have to um, take the dog out or something. No, because your dog is at work, right? So you, you already have your dog there. And you can also not say, well, I'm, I'm uh, going uh, away because I need to sport. Well, you can sport at work, right? So y your, your entire life, as it were, becomes, as it were, um, uh, fixated on these uh, premises of, of the Googleplex. And uh, that of course, also hangs together again with that changing nature of work that revolves around cognitive processes and communication. Because, of course, you never know when this brilliant idea pops up, right? It, it, it can come when you're under the shower or when you're uh, indeed sporting, and then you actually need to have that meeting right away with your co-workers to uh, work out that brilliant idea and create the next Google product, so to say. So um, this kind of uh, focus on, on communication and information and language, I think, was very nicely voiced also by uh, the Italian philosopher Paolo Virno. So he wrote the following. 30 years ago, in many factories, there were signs that commanded silence, men at work. Whoever was at work kept quiet. One began chatting only upon leaving the factory or office. The principal breakthrough in post-Fordism is that it has placed language into the workplace. Today, in certain workshops, one could well put up signs mirroring those of the past, but declaring, man at work here, talk. Do we still know, by the way, who this is? Is it a known figure for this audience? Sorry? No, 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 not Suits, but you are... It, it is a, a television show. Madman. Yes, Madman, indeed. So this is uh, Don Draper, the protagonist of uh, Madman. And it's interesting because this is a series that, that uh, takes place in the 1960s and 70s. Uh, Madman is, is, uh, an, uh, uh, is derived from Madison Avenue, so that was the place where in New York all the uh, advertisement uh, people were, uh, were working. And Don Draper is this kind of, uh, this kind of advertisement uh, genius uh, who, uh, who makes all the brilliant ads of, uh, um, uh, of the big companies. Uh, and it's interesting if you look at that uh, show that you, in a way, see this kind of, of uh, um, transfer from, from Fordism to post-Fordism, because indeed in that advertisement company, people are constantly brewing on ideas, on, on uh, the way to communicate, uh, to, to bring messages across. So creativity is, it, is it, uh, as it were, their, their main selling point, so to say. And of course, these kinds of developments also put extra pressure, you might say, on, on universities uh, as uh, factories of knowledge. Uh, uh, let's put it like that. And, and as, as the, the place where knowledge workers or cognitive workers, such as yourself, are, are to be drilled. 
And with that, um, we also see all kinds of new values entering the work ethic. So if we think of the kind of industrial work ethic, then uh, doing your duty, being obedient, being punctual, being diligent, those were the kinds of things that were valued in, in workers. But with this kind of transference to post-Fordism, other values uh, come to be uh, central, such as flexibility, uh, autonomy, and also, uh, very importantly, creativity. So this is what I uh, want to talk about next, uh, this, this, these kinds of, uh, of values of uh, creativity, or as my uh, colleague Pascal Gille once called it, creativis uh, creativism, uh, a kind of ideology of creativity. So creativity becomes a kind of requirement or ideal in all kinds of uh, uh, branches and in all kinds of um, fields of, of uh, society. So this famous uh, Apple uh, advertisement is, is, I think, very much exemplary of that, the, the, the kind of imperative to, to think different, and then the kind of images of artists, mainly, that, uh, that indeed has, uh, have done so. And you see, indeed, that in many ways, the artist, uh, which, of course, always was a kind of uh, outcast, in, in uh, let's say, previous uh, societies, that the artist now becomes, uh, in, in a way, takes central stage, or, or in, in a way, this, this ideal of the artist takes central stage, and the artist can indeed be seen as a kind of vanguard for these new forms of labor and, uh, and of the work ethic. And Pascal Giele, uh, I already mentioned him, who is a colleague of mine at the University of Antwerp, once phrased it as such that the contemporary model worker is, as it were, a capitalist caricature of the bohemian artist. Now, what did he mean by that, or what would that entail? Well, first of all, of course, if we think of the bohemian artist, then this artist has, uh, uh, he, he lives for his uh, work, right? There is not, not this kind of strict distinction between work life and personal life, because uh, his, his, all, his whole life, as it were, revolves around making art. So that means that he, has, he, he, he doesn't have a kind of nine-to-five mentality, but basically is always working, and the whole world, as it were, becomes uh, the, the workplace. And in that same way, you might say that for this total human, uh, the, as, as, as the kind of ideal of, of our contemporary working life, your whole world, as it were, is an office. You, you can work all the time in the train, uh, in bed, in the toilet, uh, wherever. You can always strike a deal, you can always uh, answer an email, and you always need to be, as it were, um, uh, uh, clicked on, so to say. And uh, indeed also, just like the bohemian artist, this kind of contemporary ideal worker is moving from project to project. It's not that you have this one task, but you are working on projects, and once you have finished the project, you are looking for the, the next project, right? So you have these kinds of uh, phases, as it were, in, in which you are working on a uh, project. And this kind of uh, um, uh, idealized shape of, of the worker becomes quite quite uh, important and, and quite dominant. Um, perhaps some of you know the name of the urban geographer uh, Richard Florida, who uh, wrote this book in the uh, early 2000s titled the, the Rise of the Creative Class. And he was indeed arguing that there's this kind of new class, which he called the creative class, which um <coughs> which uh, in, in a way was very important for, for urban life, because it used to be so that uh, first cities would build industries and then workers would come to the cities. But now, as it were, it was the other way around. First, you needed to have this kind of creative class, a kind of vibe in your city, and then work would, would eventually uh, follow. And so in, in that way, this kind of creative class becomes the kind of engine of, of contemporary uh, economy. You, so you draw in the, the hipsters and the artists and the bohemians and, and then the rest will follow, so to say. But at the same time, you see that all kinds of other uh, sorts of work 
that are not necessarily artistic, um, in a way become infected, you might say, by this work ethic of flexibility and autonomy and, and creativity. So one nice example of this is um, this uh, advertisement of, of uh, Subway, the, the uh, um, f well, fast food, is it? Oh yeah, we can uh, call it fast food, right? That are indeed looking for a sandwich artist. Uh, so a sandwich art. What is a sandwich artist? A sandwich artist uh, has a positive outlook. They thrive in a busy work environment and are keen to learn the art of great sandwich making. Uh, well, I, I will not read along, but it, it's I think very typical that even uh, such a thing as making a sandwich uh, gets uh, raised to to the level of art, uh, and it is indeed I think exemplary for the way that all kinds of spheres of work are um, uh, infiltrated, you might say, by these kinds of uh, artistic values. So uh, the, the kind of imperative to be flexible, to be uh, autonomous, to be creative, now, all, um, uh, now also uh, infiltrates domains like, well, uh, think of uh, construction workers, care workers, uh, people in, in uh, education, of course. Uh, so th 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 these kinds of, of values spread all over uh, the working life. And what the implications of that uh, are, I, I, will, uh, I will get to in a minute. Uh, first, I, I want to also look at an, another kind of symptom that is, I think, interesting with regard to uh, this new work ethic, which is the kind of popularity of all all uh, sorts of new spirituality, mindfulness, uh, meditation, and those kinds of things uh, on, the, on the workplace. <coughs> so, I, for instance, regularly get from my university these kinds of advertisements uh, or offers for uh, meditation classes or uh, mindfulness classes and those kinds of things. And, um, well, I'm, I'm always a little bit uh, um, wondering, is, is my employer really so uh, concerned with my personal well-being or is this also a kind of way to improve my productivity uh, so as to... Uh, make me uh, work even harder or, or um, uh, write even more books and, and articles and those, those kinds of things in the same way that Van Gaal also instrumentalizes the personal life of, of his players. Perhaps I'm a little bit paranoid. But in any case, there is this kind of interesting paradox going on, I think, that of course the inspiration of these practices such as meditation and, and mindfulness and, and so forth is of course these kinds of Eastern religions, and they are, are used to, as it were, steer away from the rat race of our Western capitalist societies, to steer away from the individualism of uh, our Western society, uh, and, and to get away from that all. But the paradox is, of course, that they are used in order to be even more productive, in order to be uh, in order to be able to cope with all the work pressure and indeed to be able to uh, score even higher and to succeed even better in all kinds of things. Right? Especially if you see such a book cover as Meditate to Win. Uh, it, it's a ver very fascinating um, uh, title in a way because it, it, it gets away, you might say, from... Um, it, it, it's a long way from the kind of original uh, um, uh, place that these kinds of Eastern meditation techniques had within, within their own culture. And, and this goes quite far. I, I once read this article in, in which it was said that mindfulness was actually also used as a kind of technique within the U.S. Army for uh, soldiers who had um, who were reluctant to pull the trigger right so they uh, apparently this is a thing that some soldiers in their training are uh, having difficulties with uh, with uh, shooting a rifle and then they uh, take some mindfulness classes and then they are actually able to 
kill people. Um, what I find uh, perhaps most uh, um, fascinating in, in, in sometime, uh, something that, that I, I recently stumbled upon and, and which actually was something that David, uh, uh, who, um, you, you pointed out this to me also, that there is now also this kind of link between these forms of new spirituality and uh, uh, cryptocurrencies and uh, day trading and those kinds of things, that in, in that uh, the, the, the extent to which you are well balanced and, uh, uh, and, and, and spiritual and so forth and so on will determine how successful you are uh, financially. So yeah, this was something that I encountered uh, in, uh, on, on, this, um, on this website. This is not advertisement, by the way, but uh, so just a couple of quotes which I found very fascinating. So Conscious Crypto is a private learning community offering spiritually minded individuals the guidance, education and support in mastering cryptocurrency and building wealth consciousness. As an aware and spiritually evolving being, you sense that the current financial system is serving someone but that someone isn't you. So make the conscious decision to be wealthy. Yeah, so I, I find it endlessly fascinating how these things are <laughs> indeed uh, brought together. Uh, and it, it's, I think, very exemplary for, for the kinds of things that, that I've, I've been talking about. Now, f final uh, aspect of... Um, of this, of this uh, new work ethic that I want to, to talk about is uh, self-precarization. And, and self-precarization, this is a concept by an Austrian uh, social philosopher, Isabel Loray. And of course, precarity or, or uncertainty, as, as you could also say, is again such a thing that very much belongs to the bohemian lifestyle, you might say, right? It, it's very much associated with artists, especially this kind of romantic bohemian uh, figure of the artist. Uh, think of Van Gogh, but also think of La Bohème, of, of Puccini, that the kind of ideal image of the artist is that you are starving uh, because you don't have enough uh, money to buy something because you live for your art, of course. Uh, you have an insecure income, and then eventually you die of syphilis or something. Uh, but at least you are free, right? You are, you are not living the, the bourgeois lifestyle, you are living the bohemian lifestyle, and uh, eventually perhaps you will be successful. Well, in the case of Van Gogh, this was of course after his death. Uh, today, ideally, we would want to be successful in life uh, when we are still uh, breathing. But this kind of um, this kind of self-romanticization, you might say, of, of flexibility, autonomy, and, and precarity is, uh, is very much, I think, part of, of our working life also. In, in, in that sense that security and having a boss, having a fixed contract and those kinds of things are increasingly frowned upon. And if you work, for instance, for the same employer for 25 years, uh, you used to get a gold watch or something, but now you are considered a loser, right? Uh, you, you should uh, actually be looking out for the next job when you are uh, in, in your uh, current job for, for two years or something, or even better, you don't have a fixed contract because you are uh, self-employed. <coughs> and of course, this is something that is very much part of, of our uh, contemporary platform or, or gig uh, economy. Uh, in which workers are no longer considered as employers, but as independent uh, uh, contractors. And uh, this is actually also something that artists are quite literally the, the vanguard in. So this is a, a, a graph that I um, uh, took from the, uh, um, the journal Bookman, who is, who is dealing with uh, art uh, policy. It doesn't really matter if you, if you cannot read everything in, in the graph, but let me explain a little bit what these figures say. So the, the above lines are uh, people working in the, um, in the creative industries and in the arts. And it's, it refers to the number of uh, one-person um, uh, companies, so in, in Dutch, ZZ payers, 
um, so uh, independent people who don't have uh, employees but who are working for themselves as their own boss. And you see that since 2007, uh, this figure was always high in, in the creative industries, but it is uh, increasing uh, through time. But perhaps more interesting is that Orange Line, which is uh, a people not working in, in creative industries, but the total economy. And then you see that this is indeed following this trend of uh, artists and in creative industries uh, with an increase of uh, people who are self-employed. And this is, uh, of course, not, not everyone who is self-employed is, is therefore also precarious. This is not the case. Of course, you can be self-employed and you can be quite wealthy. But there is, of course, a lot of people who are... Um, who are indeed self-employed and, and barely make an income for themselves. And this has everything to do with this uh, gig economy. Um, yeah, so this is, this is a, uh, an article a, a couple of uh, years ago in, in the uh, Dutch new newspaper, the Volkskrant. And the headline reads uh, that Deliveroo um, deliverers, they don't want to have security if I uh, have to have a fixed contract, then I will quit. And this is, uh, I think, very interesting, right? Because there, there is indeed this kind of craving for autonomy, a craving for, for flexibility, uh, and a kind of distaste for, um, uh, for fixed contracts or, or for having, uh, having a fixed job. Um, and seen from the perspective of, of these uh, uh, boys, this is probably quite understandable because they can indeed fill in their own hours. But of course, as a kind of model for the entire society, this can be quite uh, detrimental, right? For, for uh, solidarity, for, for income security, uh, because it will be different if one of those people um, falls from their bikes and breaks a leg or something, then he will, of course, also not have any uh, income. But still, there is this you might say ideology in need of freedom, of flexibility, uh, and of, uh, of autonomy, which you might say mostly will benefit the, the employer. <coughs> so what's the problem? Why am I whining about this? Uh, well, I, I already hin hinted uh, a little bit uh, to this, that all this... Um, creativism, autonomy, flexibility, and so forth, also creates precarity and insecurity in, in, a, in, in a variety of ways. First of all, one could talk about um, existential precarity, uh, the, the, the kind of precarity that your sense of self-worth and your sense of... Um, the extent to which you value yourself very much becomes dependent on this kind of success, on professional success. And that indeed, that if you do not succeed in this way, that you also uh, therefore consider yourself, so not only your, your job, but yourself as a failure. And I think this, this is something that we see very much in all kinds of uh, graphs also uh, referring to the increase of burnouts, of stress, of depression, of anxiety, and especially also in, uh, uh, with, with younger people. And, and I myself, as, as someone working at the university, also see this very much already at, uh, with, with students. And, and of course, the last couple of years with the pandemic was, was uh, uh, completely crazy. But even before that, uh, you could see um, an increase of, of students coping or dealing with, with all kinds of forms of anxiety because there's this kind of one-to-one -one relationship between their sense of self-worth, it seems, and the extent to which they succeed. And this was, I think, very nicely uh, put also by uh, Richard Sennett when he wrote the following. The statement, you lack potential, is much more devastating than you messed up. It makes a more fundamental claim about who you are. It conveys uselessness in a more profound sense. 
uh, Richard Sennett also calls this the specter of uselessness, a kind of specter that haunts us in our dreams that uh, perhaps if we don't uh, succeed, then we will become useless and it will be our own fault, right? It will be our own responsibility because apparently we fail to make the right choices. We fail to invest our human capital in a proper way. And uh, I would say again, in, in, um, in the kinds of field, fields of uh, knowledge work and creative work, I think that this is all the more, uh, um, all the more present, right? In, in academia, you see this a lot. Indeed, in, in, in creative uh, practices, you see this a lot. And this is also why in these kinds of fields of, of work, there is a lot of uh, paid, uh, sorry, unpaid overwork, right? The, the, it, it, in the sense that people are uh, willing to, to work a lot more uh, than what they are actually hired for because they don't really make this kind of distinction between, uh, between work and, um, uh, and life, right? So they, they give everything, as it were. And uh, an interesting observation is there from to French sociologists uh, Luc Boltanski and, and Yves Ciappello, who wrote the following about this. Um, measures aimed at giving wage earners greater security were replaced by measures directed towards relaxing hierarchical control and taking account of individual potential. In a political reversal, autonomy was, as it were, exchanged for security. And to give a little bit of context uh, uh, of this quote, so they are actually talking here about uh, periods after the, the 1960s, so after the kind of student revolt of, of, the, of, of 1968, where uh, there was, of course, this huge uh, uh, uprising of workers and of students against capitalism, against the kind of alienation and... and uh, uh, dullness of, of work. And what they argue is that there is a kind of irony there that this new spirit of capitalism that they, talk, that, that they are talking about in a way adopted all kinds of ideals of the student uprising, ideals indeed such as uh, uh, creativity and, and flexibility and those kinds of things, and as it were integrated it into the uh, capitalist work ethic, but trading it off against security, right? So up until then, uh, let's say workers would have a, a fixed contract and, and would, uh, would have a kind of secure income. This we did away with. So you get the autonomy, you get the kind of exciting work, uh, work life uh, moving from project to project, but you lose the uh, security. And there is, of course, a great, uh, an important class difference here, right? That, that perhaps for the, the kind of higher echelons of, of society, this can actually be a nice trade-off uh, because you want your work to be exciting and, and so forth and so on. But of course, for, for, the, for, the, uh, for the lower classes, the working classes, this trade-off was, was very, um, very negative. And uh, I guess right now we are uh, seeing very much the kinds of um, uh, consequences of that. So, what these quotes by uh, Richard Sennett and, and, and Boltanski and Ciappello, in a way, uh, say is, is quite drastic, you might say, in that all this talk about making uh, your, um, your job out of your hobby, to follow your passion, to be creative, and those kinds of things, it all leads to a situation in which we become easily exploited. In a certain way, we are, uh, in, in, in a way, of course, there was, there was this promise that we are, uh, that, that the kind of Fordist labor that Charlie Chaplin was showing, that this was alienated labor, and now we get a different kind of labor in which we are very much uh, one with, with our jobs. But in a certain way, one could also argue that we become even more alienated, even more exploitable. Um, because now not only our, let's say, physical labor power is exploited, but also our cognitive capacities, our minds, our, our entire selves even are exploited and made increasingly productive 
for uh, the capitalist machine, you might say. The, the French philosopher Bernard Stiegler uh, once called this the kind of total proletarization of life. So the next question, of course, would be uh, how to deal with that, how, how to respond to that, how to cope with precarization or with uh, this to total proletarianization of being caught in, in this constant uh, rat race. And I think, well, we might think of, of two possible answers or, or two possible solutions, uh, also referring to actually to those two versions of precarity that, that I talked about with Senate and with Boltanski and Cipello, the existential one and the uh, economic one. With regard to the existential one, um, and this is a part of, of, of the, the, the kind of first essay that I wrote about this in, in The Great Leap Inward, uh, I, I concluded with the possibility of us, uh, again, uh, re-compartmentalize -comp our life, right? In, in the sense that in, instead of making everything uh, the instrument of our productive life, we could try to, again, make distinctions in that not everything in our private life needs to be in the surface of production, but rather acknowledge that we are more things than only a worker. We can also be a parent or a son or a daughter or a volunteer or being engaged in, in politics, uh, a sports uh, a person, etc., etc., without having these things looking good on our resume, right? So that, that is, I think, an, an important uh, addition to that. Um, and this might actually mean that perhaps we should be learning to be less passionate about your job. This might sound strange, but there's actually a recent book that had the title Work Won't Love You Back, which I thought was, was, a, was a very nice title, right? Because we are all, in a way, um, stimulated to love our work, and of course it, it is very nice if you love your work, but you should also remember that perhaps your work won't always love you back. And I think we are actually gradually seeing a kind of increased consciousness of that, for instance in academia, uh, but also in, in, in other uh, um, parts of, of the working life. So. This is, of course, easier said than done. And, and uh, additionally, a kind of additional problem is that in all these other facets of life, there might also be a rat race going on. So uh, there are, of course, all kinds of books also how to be successful as a parent or how to excel in, uh, as, as, a, as a lover or as a cook or whatever, so you can in, in a way be, be uh, uh, having your rat race in all these kinds of domains, uh, because of course we are living uh, perhaps generally in this kind of culture of competitiveness. So it's very hard, I guess, to, to combat such an ideology on an individual basis, and I think we won't really be able to fix that individually, since the problem itself isn't individual. So in a way, uh, I would say, uh, but uh, I, I guess I'm a, a kind of card-carrying uh, Marxist, um, so in, in a way I would say that um, just like older forms of exploitation and precarization and proletarization, we are dealing indeed with a collective issue that also requires collective uh, action. And also this, I think, becomes increasingly clear uh, we have seen, of course, in, in recent years, all kinds of publications of increasing inequality. I think of the, the bestseller by uh, Thomas Piketty. Uh, we have seen that trickle-down economics was actually a scam. Uh, and it seems to be so that there uh, is a, a kind of new class struggle, even. And if you don't believe me, then you might believe the, the guy uh, in, in the... Um, at the bottom of, of this sheet, Warren Buffet, who also once said, there is um, a class struggle, and my class is winning. Uh, Warren Buffet being the, 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 the third, I think, richest uh, man in, in the world. 
And this class struggle is, is, I think, very interesting. It's also something that, that very much speaks to the kind of popular imagination. If we look at, uh, at, at all kinds of Hollywood movies, we see uh, um, uh, an, an interest, a fascination with all kinds of forms of, of class struggle in which the uh, underdogs are up, uh, uh, rising up against their uh, oppressors. Even in, in, in the Lego movie, indeed, there is this construction worker who is fighting precedent business. Uh, so it's, it's, it's interesting that we, we, we see this interest in uh, class struggle. But the question is, of course, again and again, uh, which kinds of classes are we talking about and who is actually combating uh, who and for what reason. Now, traditionally, this uh, answer was quite easy. Uh, in the sense that we had, of course, the pro proletariat, uh, the, the, the working class, versus uh, the capitalists, right? And, and the, the, it, it's, it's uh, this kind of interesting cartoons from, from the 19th century or, or the early 20th century that, that come along with it, uh, that you need to organize and take the big bag from, from the capitalist, of course, wearing this top hat, uh, or this uh, beautiful um, poster from, from the Dutch... Social Democratic Party, the, the, the worker who is com combating this octopus, uh, which is uh, symbolizing capitalism, which uh, has all these arms of war and, and uh, hunger and, uh, and those kinds of things. So th this was an easy time, you might say, right? In, 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 uh, in that it was quite clear who was uh, fighting who. But if we are talking about class struggle today, uh, who is indeed combating who? This was uh, one of the questions that I discussed in, in my uh, short essay. Um, and one of, one of the candidates, you might say, that, that I uh, discussed there was the precariat. And the precariat is, is a neologism. Um, it was discussed, uh, amongst others, by a British sociologist Guy Standing. I, I don't think he actually coined the term. It, it was already uh, um, present also in, in earlier French uh, articles, but, but he made the, the, the concept kind of famous. And precariat is, is of course, the um, combination of proletariat and uh, precariousness, or precarity. So a guy standing is, is most of all referring to an increasing group in society that has these kinds of short-term insecure jobs, uh, not only in, in terms of insecurity of, of uh, contracts, but also of uh, long-term perspectives of, of labor, the kinds of skills you have that you don't know whether they are still uh, important in, in a couple of years, uh, or uh, people living in social isolation and, and, and so forth and so on. But one of the problems that, that uh, Guy Standing also indicates here is that this group is so uh, diverse uh, because it, it contains not only, let's say, lower skilled labor like uh, care workers or taxi drivers or construction workers who are also working in these kinds of uh, flexible contracts, but it also contains uh, uh, academics or, or creative uh, uh, working people in, in the creative sector. Uh, and it also uh, contains uh, migrant workers who are, of course, uh, perhaps the most precarious of all, living in a kind of insecure uh, situation that, um, that they don't even know whether they can uh, um, remain here. And one of the problems of that is, according to Guy Standing, that this group is so diverse that it doesn't really consider itself as a class. So, and, and it, it's very easy, you see, also uh, for uh, populist politicians, for instance, to, to play out the one group against the other, right? To play out, for instance, the migrant worker against the, the, uh, um, the white working class, or to uh, play out the student uh, versus the, uh, um, the, the uh, retired people, or the boomer versus the Gen Z, and, and so forth and so on. So there are all kinds of... Uh, um, rifts going through the precariat, actually, that, that makes it, in Guy Standing's uh, terms, also a dangerous class, uh, a class that, that doesn't have a really kind of fixed position, but, but can go in, in all kinds of different directions. 
So what we would require, you might say, is in, in traditional Marxist terms, uh, class consciousness, right? So Marx, for instance, talks about the distinction between a what he calls a klasse an sich and a klasse für sich. Uh, the klasse an sich meaning, uh, let's say, the kind of sociological definition of a class, so a, a class that can be defined according to certain features and certain characteristics, but it only becomes a real class when it also recognizes itself as a class with a certain shared uh, interests uh, or, or perhaps even a kind of shared um, uh, identity and a shared enemy, you might say. So in, in the case of, of the proletariat, of course, this was also not something that happened immediately. They also had to, in a way, define themselves, first of all, as a uh, class. Now, I think this is uh, uh, perhaps one of the, the, the greatest uh, challenges, and, and I guess it became even more clear in, in many ways during uh, the pandemic, right? Because now it was suddenly quite clear uh, that um, we were not all in this together, right? This was, of course, what all the all the stars uh, and all the politicians were saying. I think there was this this one YouTube video of of Madonna sitting in her bathtub with rose petals in her huge mansion. Uh, and saying that the virus really doesn't make any distinctions and uh, we are all in this, get, uh, into, uh, in this together. And this was, of course, not the case, right? Because it, it was very soon clear that uh, uh, some people were more precarious, let's uh, put it like that, than, than others, that, that people without fixed contracts uh, or people indeed working in the, in the gig economy uh, or people working uh, with uh, del delivery services were precarious in, in, in various in, in various uh, ways, and uh, uh, indeed also, uh, like I uh, already mentioned, the people working in the creative sector very much also suffered from um, from the pandemic. So you might say that this was a moment. <coughs> and perhaps I'm, it's a bit of wishful thinking also from my, my part, but a, a moment of, of potential or, or a possibility of class consciousness of, uh, of the precariat, right? That we, we suddenly, as it were, saw these distinctions in uh, precarity and perhaps also realized that our precarity is not due to some kind of personal failure very often and uh, rather can be a sign of general precariousness. And that we depend for our well-being on the care from others, and uh, we depend on, on solidarity. And that also means, I guess, that reversely, um, perhaps our uh, definition of success should be altered, and that we perhaps should redefine our success uh, not so much anymore in, uh, as a kind of individual accomplishment, but rather in terms of a collective effort. So basically to conclude, um, my, uh, I would say that the only answer to these uh, new forms of, of precarity and inequality um, is uh, basically the same old answer as it always was, namely to uh, unite. And uh, yeah, I guess I will leave it at that. Thanks for your attention, and I'm looking forward to, to the discussion. Yeah, Thais, thank you so much. Uh, I have plenty of questions myself, but I am sure there's people in the, in the here as well who want to ask some questions. If you want to ask a question, raise your hand, and then my colleague will come towards you or with the microphone. I see a hand over there. Test. Cool, it works. Awesome. Uh, hi. First of all, uh, thank you for the lecture. Um, when you were talking about uh, everything that you were talking about, I'd f for me, it felt very similar to um, the concept from the, the US, like the American dream and stuff like that, uh, about how um, uh, everybody, like everybody's uh, 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 as if like everything is a big competition and everybody's in it to win it for for themselves. 
and taking into account how the American society seems to be right now, I mean, like, um, there's lots of, um, how do you call that? Uh, like, people don't seem to agree on anything in a, in, America, in America, and it feels like that's happening more and more throughout the world as well. I mean, like, the entire COVID situation has also seemed to be dividing uh, the not proletariat, but uh, the class that you mentioned. The precariat. Yeah, that. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, so I'm basically wondering: Are you optimistic? Uh, are you optimistic on the chances of it uh, of classes actually uniting uh, like that, or yeah, or not? <laughs> That's basically my question. Yeah. So uh, to to questions. Um, asking uh, about the extent to which I'm optimistic, I, I always uh, uh, always the uh, quote by the Italian philosopher Antonio Gramsci comes uh, to my mind, who always said that one needs to be uh, that one needs to have pessimism of the intellect and optimism of the will. Uh, by which he meant that that uh, in 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 theory and in your analysis, you need to. Uh, face reality, which is often uh, uh, not a reason for optimism, right? Uh, but at the same time, uh, you make that analysis and, and, and you, you do an, an, uh, an analysis with the hope that things can be different, right? That, that things can be changed. Now, to, to go uh, uh, immediately into your answer, I, I, I guess for the moment I, I'm not uh, quite optimistic on, on the possibilities of classes coming together, uh, precisely for the reason that you, you mentioned, uh, be, be because there is indeed, uh, there are huge divides uh, in, uh, in US society, but I guess also in, in, in European societies. Um, at the same time, I think the, 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 the things that I try to convey in, in this lecture um, do resonate with, with a political reality. And, and what I mean by that is that uh, the, the American dream that you, that you are talking about, I think uh, there, there is a, a, a widely shared sense uh, that this doesn't function, right? And, and this sense is, is shared uh, on both parts of the aisle, so both on 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 the on, on the right wing uh, and and in in the rhetoric of, of right wing populist parties uh, and uh, on on the left wing. Of course, the reason why that is so, why this American dream is failing, or or why in in our European societies there there is inequality and and uh, uh, there are all kinds of ruins, the reasons that they point to are are different. Uh, in that sense, that of course the, the right-wing populists tend to blame it on uh, on immigrants or on uh, the, the 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 elites uh, and, and those kinds of things, um, while uh, on uh, on the left, of course, there there is there is a different uh, story which indeed uh, uh, entails a class analysis and 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 uh, refers to to capital as as the kind of main culprit, and and uh, there, of course, they they do not find. Each other, but I, I guess where they do find each other is that this American dream is a scam, right? And and that there is something uh, horribly wrong with this increasing uh, precarity and uh, and inequality. I, I think on on that level there's uh, a, a, a lot of shared intuitions, and the, the the big challenge is indeed to bring these together and and to indeed make also let's say the the, the kind of uh, white working class people realize that the migrant is actually not their, um, not, not, not threatening them or not their enemy, but rather their, uh, uh, their ally and, and that they have a, a common enemy, so to say. Well, that would be my analysis at least. Any more questions? Yes, I see another hand. Hi, uh, thank you for the lecture, first of all. Um, I just want to ask, given uh, the, that our big failing, in a sense, or the thing that is making us so easily exploitable is that lack of divide between 
uh, like our work and our individual lives. Is there a way in the current system for us to escape that on an individual level, like barring the class consciousness, which on an individual level we can't really control? Mm -hmm. So is there something that the individual can do to get out of that, given that our whole society is structured this way? Yeah, yeah. I, I, I think um, so. Th th that is, I think, a very important question, and and uh, I the the short answer would be no. Uh, in in that sense, that that uh, since we are dealing with with a with a collective issue that uh, the, the, the solution should also be collective. Of course, that doesn't mean that, that you yourself cannot do anything, right? So that, that's not what I'm saying, but rather what I'm, I'm trying to say is that for you to do something, it would require uh, organization, uh, grouping together, uh, unionization, for instance. Uh, so uh, it, I, I think one of the uh, biggest uh, successes, actually, of uh, the kinds of practices that I'm, I'm, uh, I've been talking about in terms of um, uh, precarization and inequality, of course, one of the biggest successes was precisely to isolate people from, a, from another, right? To, to see each other as competitors, and if you feel that it's your own fault, right? That, that is the kind of... Uh, uh, widely shared uh, rhetoric that has been very successful and very uh, profitable also. Uh, because if you blame yourself, then you don't blame the system, so to say. And uh, I think, so the, the, the book, um, The Great Leap Inwards, is, is actually where I described that uh, mostly, uh, where this Great Leap Inward is a kind of play of words uh, referring to the, the Great Leap Forward. Uh, this was, of course, this kind of uh, uh, huge uh, uh, and disastrous plan of, of Mao to, uh, as it were, um, uh, remake society. And, in, in, uh, uh, of course, because of those kinds of, of disasters, uh, after the fall of the Berlin Wall in, in, uh, in, in, the, in the 1980s, we have, in a way, done away with all those kinds of grand schemes. And the only thing that was still uh, malleable, that, was st that we could still work on, was ourselves, right? So we became these kinds of entrepreneurs of the self. But indeed, this also put all the kinds of responsibility of, su or of success and failure on yourself. And I guess since 2016, when I pu published this book, I have seen some... Uh, I, I do see some change there. Because, uh, well, if I take my own professional... Um, uh, a situation of, of, of academia as, as an example. There are probably many other examples, but this is the one I, I know best. L let's say up until then, there was uh, already a, a huge uh, complaints about work pressure and, and those kinds of things, but everyone considered it to be their own problem, right? So you need to do a time management course, or you need to work on yourself, or you need to do uh, mindfulness, and, and those kinds of things, which are all individualized solutions, right? While sure, but, but while, while um, um, uh, gradually, we, of course, noticed that these were not individual issues, that these, these were actually widely shared issues that also would require collective action. So then you got all kinds of actions, such as the uh, Maagdehuis besetting in, at the University of Amsterdam, where students would occupy the uh, main building of the university. Uh, you had a collective group called uh, WO in Action, uh, who, who fought for... for uh, more uh, funding for higher education and those kinds of things. These were, of course, all initiated by individuals, but these individuals got together and started organizing and, and as to improve their, their situation. And I guess this is, in a way, the way that it always went, right? Uh, also in the 19th century, with, uh, with workers and, 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 and parties, it all starts with, with people uh, grouping together and, and uh, exclaiming their solidarity and sharing their experience and then changing the situation, right? It it's, sounds easy. It's of course, it, it is, of course, not easy, but uh, it, it's also not impossible. There's nothing you can do yourself except come together, something like that. Yeah. Uh, I saw another hand before. Yeah, right there. Hi. <clears throat> uh, 
Uh, thank you so much. And there was this one slide which really uh, took me a little bit, which was great. Um, it was like a book, a, a red book with a yellow thing in the middle which said uh, devotion to work um, only makes you... Uh, Yes, that one. the devotion to our job keeps us exploited, exhausted, and alone. That really took me. I loved it. But actually, my question is not even about that. My question <laughs> is about the, the opposite. So once upon a time, um, I thought it was very deep and woke, as, as, as Gen Z would say. Um, a few years ago, I heard this quote by John, John Stewart, the funny guy. And he made a joke about how if you asked any president... Uh, from the past, Obama, Bush, uh, American presidents. So how do you solve all the problems that we have? Be it poverty, uh, immigration, ec economy, and all of that. He, he said as a joke that all the presidents would say that the best way to solve it is if everyone just worked harder. So if engineers did a better job, then maybe we would be uh, better off. If a scientist worked a bit harder, maybe climate change would be uh, almost solved by now. If this happened, then that. How would you react to something like that? Ah. Um, yeah, that's, a, that's an interesting question. Yeah, of course, there, there's this, this famous um, uh, story also that... Um, who was it? I, th I think it was the uh, economist uh, uh, Keynes who uh, was very much worrying about um, the fact that in, in, let's say, 50 years or so, so that would be our time now, that uh, so much work would, uh, would have been uh, automated uh, and mechanized that uh, we, uh, th there would be a problem of what to do with all the free time, right? So there would be a kind of general sense of how would people deal with all the free time that they, uh, that they had. Now, of course, uh, th this is quite... Uh, far from what actually happened, because we, we seem to be even uh, working harder than, uh, than ever. So in that regard, my answer would, would not really uh, be in line with, with the one that you would propose, that if everyone would just work a little harder, then, uh, then all problems would be uh, fixed. Because, of, uh, of course, it, it would depend on what are you working hard on, uh, so, so what, what, it, what are the kinds of jobs that are, um, uh, that are, that are preferred or, or that are uh, privileged? Uh, and if, if everyone, uh, let's say, in, in, um, uh, in finance or, or whatever, if, if they work very hard, then that might not be uh, the best thing, right? Not, not to, um, so I'm not sure whether there are any finance people here, not, not to blame anything on, on you, but, but uh, just to say that working hard in itself uh, I think it, it, it is not uh, or should not be taken as, as a kind of core value. Rather, uh, the, the, the kind of purpose of work is, of course, to, to improve our, uh, our lives and, 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 and to, to improve the kind of uh, general situation of, uh, of society. Uh, and for that, I think uh, uh, we do not necessarily need to work harder in general, but perhaps we, we should have different kinds of work. And there's, of course, this, this famous essay by the uh, anthropolo uh, anthropologist uh, David Graeber, who wrote about uh, bullshit jobs, and, and who said that a lot of jobs actually in, in, our, uh, in our Western uh, society are bullshit jobs in the sense that no one really needs them, and even the people doing the jobs think it's, it's bullshit what they are doing, right? So they, they themselves are, are not even seeing the point of it. And, uh, and, and this is, of course, one of the problems, I guess, of, 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 this, of this ideology that we also have this, this widely shared sense that if you don't work, then you are a kind of failure or you, 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 do, you do not count in society. And, and that is, I think, very much part of, of, of our uh, shared ideology. And it wasn't always so. According to some historians, people in the Middle Ages worked far less than, uh, than we today. So we ov always have, have this kind of uh, idea of, of, of history that people were working the entire day only to get some scraps of food or something. But historically speaking, this, this, this seems not to be so. People had actually a lot, of, lot more free time than, than we today. I have a question from the live stream uh, from Hidde, who was asked, 
Why would we think about solutions to the diagnosed problems in terms of 19th century concepts, class, and not come up with new concepts that accommodate our thinking towards solutions better? Um, yeah, so, so the, the question, of course, presumes that there are uh, other concepts that... Um, uh, that deal with the solution better. I, I'm, I, I would be curious uh, which one those are, but I wouldn't say actually that the concept of class is, uh, is outdated. Indeed, uh, it has been declared outdated for, uh, for a while, and, and uh, uh, at a certain point, of course, we were all um, meant to believe that we were actually already living in a classless society, but at the same time, and I quoted here uh, Warren Buffet himself, uh, uh, he uh, even argues that uh, there is a class struggle going on and that indeed his class is, uh, is winning. So in that regard, I, I think this, this 19th century concept is, uh, uh, is in need of an update. So we cannot have the exact same class analysis as the one that, uh, uh, for instance, Karl Marx uh, did. But for me, that doesn't mean that, that the, the concept of class is, is entirely um, uh, outdated. And I, and I think it, it might be very interesting to, as it were, um, to, to, to think about it anew if it, uh, if it helps. And, and it helps me, at least, in my analysis. Thanks. Uh, I saw another, another hand before, yeah. Yes. Uh, thank you for your uh, very enlightening talk. Um, you touched upon uh, various um, issues pertaining to the neoliberals, uh, neoliberalist system. So for example, like the intra-class competition among the precariat and there's the commodification of all kinds of institutions, including the academic one, um, sort of perpetuating the system as it is. Um, Anti-capitalism is integrated within uh, capitalism through capitalist realism. And uh, lastly, language uh, changes in favor of economic terminology. So that brought me to the question, uh, has neoliberalism become a form of totalitarianism or say like a liberal-ish version of totalitarianism? Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, th th that's, that's a really fascinating question. And actually it, in, in the original essay that I wrote on, on the total human, I, uh, I do touch upon that in, in the final part of, of the essay, and I, and I indeed uh, uh, discuss the idea of, of neoliberalism being a form of totalitarianism. Of, of course, that, that, that sounds quite drastic because, because we tend to associate totalitarianism with the most horrible regi regimes in, in the 20th century, uh, with Nazism and with, with Stalinism. But, but I, I think, uh, indeed, you need to use that term uh, precise, and I think you point to the way that, that you could use it, namely, uh, so it, in, in the essay I refer to uh, the work of uh, Ernst Jünger, uh, the, the, the German uh, uh, thinker and, and philosopher, who talked about uh, what he called the totale mobilmachung, so the, the total mobilization. And he talked about uh, wars in the 20th century, indeed, as this total mobilization, by which he meant that it's no longer a kind of uh, mere facet of society, namely the army that goes to war, but it's the entire society that is in war, right? And each, each uh, aspect of society is, as it were, affected by it. And in the same way, totalitarianism would, would entail that there isn't indeed one uh, facet, one aspect that is untouched by, uh, by this system, right? And, and I think uh, that is very much true for uh, neoliberal capitalism in, in that it, it, uh, it tends to um, uh, interfere and it tends to, uh, um, uh, uh, it tends to uh, integrate uh, everything in, in this system. So uh, 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 also leisure time and of course uh, the, all the things that we do online as it were, each, each moment of the day as it were is incorporated in, uh, in this system. Uh, so in that regard, I, I think you could call it totalitarian. And, and in, in the essay, I also refer to a very nice little book by uh, Jonathan Crary, 
which is titled uh, 24-7. And he talks there about uh, sleep, right? And, and sleep, he says, is in a way one of, the f uh, one of the last remaining bastions, which cannot be uh, commodified and, and cannot be, uh, as it were, um, uh, inf infested by, by, by capital. And he, he, he discusses all kinds of ways in, in which uh, uh, industries actually try to do that. Of course, you have all kinds of pills and, and mattresses and, and those kinds of things, but also actually technologies which try to reduce the number of hours of sleep that, that one would uh, require. So there are all kinds of experiments, apparently, to create a sleepless soldier, uh, a soldier that, uh, that wouldn't require sleep anymore, or sleepless worker, you could, of course, also imagine. And it's interesting, I think, that, that uh, you also see this kind of distaste for sleep amongst successful people, right? Uh, there was, of course, Donald Trump who boasted that he would require only four hours of sleep, right? Because it was because all the all the time that you uh, waste on sleep, so to say, are also moments that you can make a brilliant deal or that you can make some money. So, in in and and you see that actually the the number of hours, average hours that we sleep, has been decreasing in in the last uh, couple of decades. So, in that regard, I I, I think it's it's very very interesting. Uh, to, to think about it in, in that way, as a, as a kind of system that tries to gain control over all facets of, of life, even, even sleep. We have time for one last short question. I, thought, I think I saw him before, so I, I give the floor to you. Hi, thank you for the lecture. Um, my question pertains to something that, uh, to me at least, wasn't discuss that much, the, the, the morality, uh, the question of morality, because, well, we're facing uh, kind of having a battle be between precariats and employers, in a sense, but as you indicated in the lecture, the precariats are very much precariats of their own will, due to the rise of individualization uh, and the uh, ideal self-actualization. Many people themselves choose to be precariats, also like the article in the, Volk uh, in the, the Volksrand. Mm -hmm. Um, so at that point, who is responsible for the exploitation, barring any negative uh, connotations of that word? And what does, this, does that mean for a potential new class struggle? At the moment, you might not have one central antagonist who you can point all the blame to because you yourself have chosen this life as a part of your self-actualization. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, that, that, that's a very good question and also a very difficult one because in, indeed you, you touch upon um, uh, indeed a, a, a very important point that, uh, let's say, in, in, the, in the old class struggle, you could point to the man with the top hat, right? He's the enemy, so that, that, that's quite clear. Uh, but uh, I guess today that, that is uh, a little bit more difficult. We have, of course, figures like Jeff Bezos and, and, and Mark Zuckerberg. We, we can all hate them. Uh, but um, at the same time, it, it, it's not so easy because, as it were, within ourselves, this struggle is, is some... Uh, we we e sometimes even have a kind of little class struggle within ourselves, right? So I if you are asking about the morality... I think the, the important thing of, um, of such an analysis would be that uh, would be indeed to refrain also from uh, pointing fingers too, too quickly and too easily. And I, and I think actually there we can um, uh, also, uh, or I at least, would, would uh, take also Marx again as an example, who also said, well, uh, the, the point is not to blame the individual capitalist uh, or, or the, the individual uh, figure uh, because they are only a function in a system, right? So the point is, is not to, to do away with this, this, this one individual, but rather to make a, a system analysis and to, to look at the kind of mechanisms that, that lead to such a situation. And, and that was, of course, why he made these, uh, these very complex analyses of, of capitalism. And, and why he moved away also a little bit from uh, a, a, a focus on, on capitalists as a class 
towards a capital as a system, right? So I, I think there's, there's also a, 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 a distinction. There are, of course, always people very much profiting from such a system. And, and that is, I think, something that you can um, uh, look at. With regard to the uh, self-precarization, that is indeed a, a different kind of problem and also quite, quite a difficult one. Uh, there, I would say, um, in part, I would say it, it's, it's the kind of old tale of uh, false consciousness in, in the sense that uh, uh, people can, of course, make choices uh, or, or have certain values that actually, objectively speaking, run against their own best interests. Um, that, that is, of course, a, a kind of tricky idea, but, but because then you, you tend to tell to people that you know it better than they themselves do. But if you, of course, you can try to raise consciousness about it and, and, and show how these mechanisms work, and, and perhaps you could even indeed uh, convince these Deliveroo uh, uh, guys that it, it, it might not be in their best interest to, uh, to have such a, a flexible uh, contract. Because indeed, if they would break their leg, for instance, they would, would be suddenly uh, without a job. And, and that might also be very harmful for them. Right? So yeah, that, that would be my answer. OK, so before I ask everybody to once more give an <coughs> applause to for Thijs. I'm going to make a very ironic announcement because on the 11th of May, Patrick Verwijmer is coming here to tell us about stocks and how to invest in stocks and how <laughs> the one-on-one of the stock can change. <laughs> Believe me, the irony is not lost on me. Uh, thank you so much for being here tonight. Thank you, Thijs, for an illuminating lecture. Uh, everybody, please give a warm applause once more. Uh, thank you all, Sam.